other than progress. So this is always kind of informal. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. In the meantime, I will monitor the chat to um, see if there's anything in the chat. So let's start today with um, the luxury results uh, that I worked on last week. We're still waiting for a, 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 a I guess, a more um, avant-garde or whatever graphic. But in the meantime, I think the data is kind of interesting. So let me share my screen. And let's take a look at the, that's Lee County Collier County, okay. Can everybody see that okay? Just give me a thumbs up or hello or, um, so. I can see it. We, um, we publish, you know, every month around the 10th, the stats for the prior month comparing month over month. And we started last year with the idea for the luxury group that we would publish the luxury stats for all sales in Collier County over a million dollars. And we got derailed a little bit by, I think one of the groups wanted to make it a little fancier. Instead, we've used the luxury uh, fonts and colors, and I think we'll continue to publish these uh, from every month now on because it's very useful information. And the luxury market over a million dollars is performing quite a bit differently than the overall market. So let's take a look. Um, pricing, uh, median sales pricing, this is Collier County sales over $1 million, which now is a, a lean to on a canal. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, it's, a, it, it's certainly, there's a lot more million dollar properties than there ever were before because of the rise in prices, increase in values, and to a certain extent, the revaluation that our area experienced because of COVID, because of people coming down here and going, wow, uh, we're, we're, this is a lot cheaper than it is in California or, or in, in, uh, in Arizona. So we revalued quite a bit. So people's values reset. Um, a lot of equity in the market. A lot of people paid cash or uh, took money out of, the, out of their market for some of it. A lot of people took advantage of the tremendous rates uh, that, were, that were offered rather than you know, liquidating some of their investments. So we take a look at the median sales price. Uh, 1.913 overall, single family homes, very similar. That's an unusual occurrence that they're both the same. But remember the media is the middle. So if there's 188 sales, you know, you go to the middle sale in there, not number 90, 98 uh, or 99, that's the median. And why do we use the median? We've always used the median as our barometer of what's happening to prices because uh, we now report the average uh, in our uh, neighbor stats, but uh, the average basically can be skewed a great deal. It can fluctuate a great deal, especially with 188 sales. You know, you could have a, a $10 million sale that would increase the average tremendously. And, and the same as you could have a large number of 1 million or low 1 million sales that would bring it down. So we use median. Um, the median price went up 6% over last year. Now, you know, 6% is, is maybe people would call that normal appreciation four to 6%. Um, but it's certainly not the 35% that we saw when we looked at the overall market. So prices in this segment of the market are not increasing at the same rate that prices in the, in the, in the overall market are, uh, which is means that there's a little more stability here uh, and that, and, and, it, and it, it tells you that look at the condos, um, that price is up 12%. And part of the reason for that is that there are not very many single family homes available. So a lot of people have, have been driven to condos. Um, in addition, some of the higher end condos sold quite well last in, in February of 22, which drove the median up. So again, still these are, not numbers that we saw when we looked at the overall market where we're still seeing median prices going up, you know, in the 30% range. 
days on market down to 33. That's really low for uh, luxury uh, prices. It's down 72% over last year. We went for a long time with um, days on market for luxury properties, at least in the 90s, uh, for, for many years. So this is an amazing. The rate of turn is, is significantly greater now than it was. Some really good news here. Look at new listings, up 8%. We've not seen listing growth like that in the overall market for some time. So, you know, you had 407 new listings and pendings were up, uh, but only about the same amount as new listings. So this is starting to show some more balance in the market for homes over a million dollars. We're adding 407, we're pending 403. So we're not seeing a huge, um, change where we're continuing to drive down the available inventory. Uh, if you go over to the inventory numbers, you can see again, these numbers are quite a bit healthier than the, the, uh, their, the, their counterparts uh, for the overall market, where we're seeing less than one month inventory overall. So look at, we have a little bit of inventory here. We have 2.3 months of inventory, although down quite a bit from last year, uh, still, a little bit more of a balance there where you can, it's still very much a seller's market, but there's still a little bit of inventory. Inventory meaning choices. Choices meaning more um, listings coming into the market, about the same coming out. Condos show the lowest, but if I'm not mistaken, the condo inventory is 0 0.7 months for the overall market. So we're seeing that in the luxury market, there are a few more choices for buyers, um, even though the inventory levels are down substantially over last year. And again, in closed sales, we saw the overall closed sales in the market being down 40%. And so we're down, although we're down 23%, uh, we're still not down at the, uh, the rate that we were, were talking about in the overall market. So if you're working in the luxury market and you wanna share this information with your customers, um, I'm going to put this on Facebook and I'm going to send it out in an email to every one of our luxury agents. So you have this to share with your customers and I'll continue to put this out until we come up with a, a, a sexier graphic, I guess. Is what, all right, we have another person joining us. iPhone BB, I'm not sure who that is, but welcome. Um, so the numbers up above the sale sign, we, we, we saw... We saw 56 condos, 132 single family homes, and 188 overall sales in the million dollar and up market in Collier County. Um, but take a look at the relationship of list price to sell price. And this uh, is the last list price. It's not the original list price, uh, which probably would be a little different number because many of the luxury properties start out at a little higher price than they settle out at. And we're starting to see, looking at daily uh, MLS patterns over the last seven days, we're starting to see more price reductions and price increases. And so the market overall, and talking to people empirically, I'm interested if you want to share your experience, the market appears to be uh, slowing a little bit. We, we, we see it, still see multiple offers. We still see some, some uh, frantic bidding but for the most part agents are reporting to me and talking on the various zooms uh that the market is 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 steadying a little bit and that some of these ridiculous price increases and properties that have been priced well above their market are starting to settle down a little bit so that's good news uh so there's a lot of good news on this chart more new listings and pendings um more month supply in million dollar and up properties than in the standard market. And prices, median prices a little bit uh, more steady. So let's try and look at Lee. And, and I really want you to look at Lee because it's a, a, amazing how much difference it is. Um, okay. Can everybody see Lee County okay there? Yes? 
Okay. Yes. Cool. All right. So Lee County, look at Lee County. I mean, these are sales in Lee County over a million dollars in February of 2020. Oops. I see a little problem up there. That should say February 2022 over February 2021. That is operator error on the part of broker Jeff. And we can obviously fix that before we put this out there. Hmm. I usually try to check this pretty thoroughly, but you can see that I missed that part. Anyhow, it's February 2022 over February 2021. And look at the difference. Uh, median price is down slightly, right? Um, that's an, an 133 overall sales. So if 67 was, was the median price, then that was down a little bit over last year. Um, so much different picture for Lee County sales over a million dollars than the Lee County overall picture, and especially than the, uh, the Collier uh, picture, which we showed flat to a slight increase. So, um, and notice that the median prices are somewhat lower than they are, they are in Collier, and that, that's to be expected. Days on market, again, down to 39, down 60% over 2021. But look at listings, new listings and pendings. New listings up 114%. So that is telling us that a lot of people are putting their places on the market. If there's 255 new listings, there's only 133 sales. That means we're building some inventory. Hooray! Um, and it also means that we took out 233 when pending, not as much as the new listings, and up 59% over last year. So the luxury market in Lee County is much healthier and is getting healthier. And this is really good news to share with your luxury buyers who may have heard that everything's overpriced, nothing's moving, there's multiple offers on everything. Not so much true. Look at the inventory levels, although down over 2021, still we have what's kind of becoming a little more healthy supply, three months of overall, 3.2 months of single family and 2.8 months of condos. So what does that say? That says choices to me. That says there's a lot more choices out there than in the overall market where we're seeing inventory levels right at one month or slightly under. Uh, as we go and look at the sales, look at the sales difference of 30% for condos and 31% for, for, for single family homes and overall. Good news, good news for this market. Good news that things are happening in this market. So if you were gonna look at doing a little farming or a little uh, uh, work in some of the Lee County communities as a luxury agent, this is all, I think, pretty good news. It's also good news to share with your customers that are thinking about buying in Lee County and are, are, are looking for in that million dollar range. And it, it doesn't take a lot in some of, the, especially in some of these newer communities to see these prices going upwards of a million. So hopefully good information to share with your uh, customers. I will fix that headline and send it out to everybody uh, and, and put it out on Facebook. So hopefully this is good information to share with your customers. And until we come up with another more sexy graphic, I'll continue to put this one out there because I think it has good information in it. Any comments, uh, Mark, what do you think? Okay, I don't think Mark's there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to digest it a little bit. I'm, I'm not sure that I am framing it in my mind correctly. All right. Well, like I say, this is the first time we put these things out since November. So I'm going to start doing them again. I think we'll start being able to see some trend lines as we do it every month. So I'll start that. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get the March numbers out earlier in March than this year. So anyhow, this is much different than the overall picture that we presented for the overall market. And it, it looks as though there are signs that it's, it's, it's healthy and getting healthier. So, all right. So today's uh, contract topic is multiple offers. We did a presentation um, at NABOR not too long ago. So I'm going to use that PowerPoint, but I, I, I really want to be um, to have this be more interactive. 
and I want you to be feel free to ask questions as we go along. So we did this presentation um, I think about last summer. I can I can certainly take a look at the, the date on the file, but um, we did this presentation. It was pretty well pretty well accepted, and and uh, I don't know that we recorded it, but we're recording it today. Um, any of these slides that you'd like are available to you. If the whole deck will help you, but I'm going to walk through this. And uh, like I say, please feel free to chime in um, because just as it was when we made this uh, presentation up, it's a jungle out there. Um, I get a lot of calls from a lot of agents that are dealing with multiple offers, either on the buyer side or the seller side. And there's still um, quite a bit of um, uh, angst, I think would be the best thing. People are uh, uh, really someone is going to get frustrated in a multiple offer situation. It can't be, not everybody's going to win. And if there's a buyer that's been um, through this three or four or five times, obviously the, the tension level uh, is, is great. So it's a jungle out there. And, you know, one of the things that really is important for you to, to do is to be calm. You're not the one buying the house. Be calm, be a, be a source of steadiness for your buyer or seller, because there's a lot of emotion involved selling, a lot of emotion involved buying, especially when you are competing in a, in a, in a, for more than, you know, with more than one buyer for the place. So we're gonna talk a lot about setting expectations because I think that's the very best thing you can do as a professional is to set the expectations of your buyer and seller right away, right out of the gate. Multiple offers, we'll talk a little bit about ha how to handle them, what the best way to, to work with your seller on. Uh, we have a spreadsheet that we've developed that does a pretty good job of laying out everything from the type of contract down to whether there's an escalation clause, whether there's any, you know, what the, what the deposits are in, in, in case of financing. And it, it's pretty easy to, to make an apples to apples comparison if you have that uh, in your repertoire. We'll talk about escalation clauses. Uh, since this presentation was done, uh, both Farbar and Nabor have come out with an escalation clause. And we, we were pretty early on in the game to offer this to our agents, uh, worked with um, uh, one of the local attorneys. We come up with what we thought was a really good one. Um, we did not put it in the library because we want to know real briefly what your what your goals are by using one um, I see a lot some of them come in where they've used it and, and if it's not the right scenario and you're not familiar with how to use it and how to explain it to your buyer you know it's really a good idea if you're thinking about using one to give broker Jeff a call I'm easily you can reach me I'm not that hard to reach and if, if it's an if it's a 911 just say hey I gotta have an answer right away but let's talk a little bit about escalation clauses and when you should use them and when they're effective. Um, appraisals, um, when we did this slide presentation um, a few months ago, were a lot more of a problem than they are today because we had all these uh, high sales that weren't comps yet. So you take a contract, the appraiser would go in and look at the comps for the last six months, and they weren't keeping up with the with the rising prices. Now, I don't hear too much about appraisals. How, does anybody want to chime in? I mean, most of the properties that I see are appraising at or near their contract value, which means that unless you're uh, going for a property that is way over the, the market and your comps don't support it, your comps are supporting it because the market has had um, over a year now of uh, new higher sales that the appraisers can go on. So we haven't had as much of an appraisal problem as we've had there for a while. Okay, what's going on here? We're going to summarize the key points. And then, of course, you've got Q&A the whole time that you're on here. Just uh, raise your hand or shout out. So why is it a jungle out there? 
be calm and respectful. I said that in the, at, the, at, the, at the outset. There's a lot of emotions there, a lot of things happening, a lot of dynamics in the market that weren't there um, two years ago. Uh, for a long time between probably 2014, 2015, and 2019, the market was pretty balanced. It was, it was maybe a slight seller's market as we got a little further toward 2019, but the market was pretty well balanced. The number of multiple offers and the number of buyers having to make multiple offers on properties to get what they wanted was much different. Um, remember the code of ethics. You know, what's the code of ethics? You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I, I, I get um, a number of calls, as you might imagine, and I get some wacky behavior on the part of agents, you know, just yelling and screaming at each other and calling each other names and telling each other that they're incompetent and all that. You know, the whole purpose that we have of the code of ethics is to treat everybody fairly, to remember that your customer is, deserves all the respect and care and that you are also gonna do a lot better if you have respect and uh, good communication with the other side. I've known people that have won bids because they presented a nice cover letter on their offer. They were calm, they called a listing agent, they talked back and forth before they submitted their offer. And, and lo and behold, their offer got selected where another one that was even higher did not. So remember that. We're gonna talk a little bit about a problem that I see in the, in, in the contracts. I, I, I do, as you know, probably, I look at all the contracts every month and um, I, I see some, some interesting things sometimes, but that time uh, of offer uh, acceptance and delivery has to, be, has to be real. I mean, you can't wait a day after your offer is expired to get the offer back from the seller and say, oh, I got a contract here. No, you don't. If there's ever any challenge to the contract and the time of offer and acceptance is not inside when everything's signed and it hasn't been uh, amended, you could run the risk of losing your contract. So be careful with that. And then the second word is delivery. So even though you may send a counter offer over to your buyers, say, okay, the seller will accept this, sends it over, the buyer's thinking about it, doesn't sign it right away and deliver it back. And in the meantime, here comes another offer. Yeah. Better offer, better than the, the seller just countered. Can the seller rescind the offer? Absolutely. The seller can rescind their counter offer or a buyer can rescind their counter offer at any time prior to it being accepted and delivered. Signed, sealed, and delivered. So be careful with that. When things are flying around as quickly as they are with some of these contracts, you really have to be careful to make sure that the offer gets signed by your customer and delivered back. Delivery meaning email, receipted email back, not text, email back. Got to be a written form. Um, always take a look at the MLS remarks at the bottom of the offer they will oftentimes tell you what's going on with that. Please submit all offers by Thursday, March 31st at 5 p.m. So if there's no update to the status and you're looking at April 1st to put your offer in, might be a good idea to read that and call the listing agent and say, hey, have you closed out all your offers? Many times they'll say no. We're waiting another couple of days, you can get in. But the MLS remarks will tell you a lot about what you know might be a good idea for you and your buyer when they're submitting the offer. And I have a lot of people, uh, I don't do a lot of deals, but I, the few I've done, I, I just, you know, this place has a new HOA rule that you can't rent it for one year or two years after you buy it. And you'll get an offer in and they'll go, um, what's the rental policy? You cannot, you know, it's right in the confidential remarks. You can't rent the place for one year after living there until you've lived there a year or sometimes now two years and even three years because they're trying to cut down on the amount of people that are buying properties to rent. 
And if that's in the confidential remarks and your customer wants to rent it, save yourself some time and effort. That's what that information is there for. Mark, you got your hand up. Just to add one more thing about reading the MLS remarks is I have a, a listing that the quarterly association fees were not going to be the same throughout the year. The first quarter was low, and then the second quarter began a higher rate. And you wouldn't know that necessarily by looking at the numbers, you need to read those MLS remarks. So really, I mean, it's part of your whole uh, relationship with your buyer. All these things we talk about in contracts and everything else, they're all, they're all there to build your relationship with your buyer. And, and you know, I, I probably sound like a broken record, which I am, <laughs> um, but your 401k uh, retirement plan in this business is really based on your relationship with your customers and how they will recommend you to other people and how they will remember you and do business with you in the future. So that's your retirement account. And the more you do a good job with customers and look out for their best interest and, and check out everything before you put an offer in, the more likely they are to be very happy with you and to use you again. So one more thing, uh, Jeff, is, is while we rely on the information that's in those fees, I've also seen circumstances where agents left out the transfer fee. Okay. So um, either in the contract, um, if they were on the listing side, they, they didn't spell out that the buyer would pay the transfer fee, even though probably the contract says they will, but the buyer uh, isn't aware that there might be a $2,500 or a $5,000 or a $7,500 transfer fee because there was an inadvertent error in the MLS and it didn't show it. Yeah, the, the, the issue there is that um, reliance on the fees and the, and the information in the MLS is um, buyer must independently verify. So if you're looking at a couple listings in, in a neighborhood and one of them has a $1,500 transfer fee and the other one doesn't, pretty good idea to, to maybe call the management company, but it's a pretty good idea to say the one agent left it out. And where we really see a lot of issues with fees is most every one of these associations raises their fees January 1. They do January 1 to December 31 budgeting, and the fees go up usually in the first quarter of the next year. So you'll see a lot of listings that don't get updated in the fourth quarter for, the next, for what's going to happen. So always do as much research as you can to make sure that your customer understands what what they're buying and with regard to proof your offer was presented we have a a, a little a box below the signature line on the neighbor contract that says seller rejects your offer signature and date now yes it's confusing i've seen sellers sign there thinking they were accepting the offer but really it's there and it's a great idea in multiple offer situations to have your seller sign the offers that weren't accepted and send that back over to the other side. There's always people that are gonna say, well, I don't think you presented my offer. I think I had the best offer and I have no idea you know, wh whether you presented it or not. And there is a provision that's been added to the code of ethics that allows you to request of the listing agent proof that your offer was presented. So why not just have your seller it's in a multiple offer situation, even if it's just two or three offers, have your seller sign the ones that they didn't take and send it back over to the other side. That allows proof positive for the uh, agent on the other side to share with their customer that the offer was not, not accepted. So kind of an important step. So I have a, a letter. This is one that, um, that, we was a popular on Facebook. I think it came from James Shaw's thing, but basically uh, I'll be more than happy to send you a letter called, sorry, your offer was not accepted. And it basically is a word format. You can personalize it to yourself and your signature, but what you're doing is you're sending information over to the other side saying, really appreciate your professionalism. I appreciate submitting the offer. Unfortunately, your offer wasn't accepted. If you want to, give a list of how many offers were there, uh, how many were over the list price, 
how many we're financing. We want to give the other side a little bit of information so that the agent on the other side who's trying to console an unhappy buyer at least has some things to share. Okay. We 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 there was 12 offers, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. I know you had a great offer, but yours was financing, and there was eight of them that were cash. So that could have been a, a affected your offer. And at least there's something you're saying thank you to the other agent. Um, I, I, I would probably show a little different format here. Maybe if we have time, I'll show it to you at the end. But basically, you're sending something professional over to the other side saying, sorry, your offer wasn't accepted. I appreciate your professionalism. I appreciate your, your taking the time. We know it was a lot of time for you to show the property, present the offer. And it's just a... a, a a, a massive effort to be professional and to be considerate of the other side. And that's, I, I know that the one of the transactions I worked on last year had 14 offers and people were calling, what happened to my offer? And I sent this letter out saying, sorry, your offer wasn't accepted with all the information about the offers. Thank you for your professionalism. And oh, by the way, um, a copy of the contract being, you know, the signature saying we, we rejected your offers attached. So now you've proved your offer was presented, you thank the other side, praise them for the professionalism and gave them some information. Um, great idea, it doesn't take much time to do. I got a lot of good feedback. Email me back. Thanks for taking the time. Same. Setting expectations is, if you get nothing else on today's, Lesson. Your job, whether you're working with a buyer or whether you're working with a seller, is to set the expectations of today's market buyer or seller so that they're not shocked at the outcome. Obviously, the reality of the market is very competitive. The reality of the market can seem very unfair to a buyer uh, and very confusing to a seller. So let's talk about setting expectations with sellers and buyers. So the first thing you want to do, maybe even when you're taking the listing contract, is to talk to the seller about the fact that you got a really nice home here. It's in a popular neighborhood. There's a really good chance you're going to get more than one offer. Let's talk about how we want to handle that. Let's talk about the information we want to share back with the other side. Whether you know, and and let's make sure the seller fully understands how that's going to work. Mr. Ms. Seller, I have this spreadsheet that I use. I'm going to lay all this information out across here. You're going to be able to decide after you're looking at all the offers. We're going to try to make sure that they all give us time to, to review the offers. And this is how this is going to work. And here's the information uh, you know, that we, we can share with your permission, the information we can share back to the other side. Okay. Confirm what information will be shared. How are we going to evaluate offers? Again, I think this spreadsheet is a good way to do it, um, especially if you have an analytical buyer or excuse me, seller that wants to see all the details. Um, maybe they don't want to see all the details. Maybe they only want to see um, the price, the terms, and is there going to be any kind of post occupancy agreement? And so how am I going to evaluate those offers? Um, we're going to consider backup offers. Um, I, I strongly feel in this market that probably somewhere between 20% and a third of all offers that are accepted never make it to the closing table and really don't stay out there that long. There's 183 back on markets in today's MLS and probably more, well more than half of that were out there for less than than 20 or 30 days. So what's happening is a lot of offers are being tendered and accepted and then rejected. Does that mean the buyer's making offers on more than one property? Possibly. Does that mean the buyer gets in there and does an inspection and doesn't want to mess with it? Possibly. Uh, so backup offers are great. So if you go back to your people and you have an offer that was very close to the one you accepted, you might reach out to that agent and say, hey, do you want to put a backup offer? And you can have more than one backup offer. But backup offers, especially if they are of good quality 
and mirroring the quality of the offer that your seller selected can mean that you can now decide to make that backup offer primary and um, you can not have to go back on the market, more showings, more open houses, all those kinds of things that tend to be uh, stressful for a seller. So backup offers are real. So with buyers, you got to be real. That's why we have that chart that shows the percentage of list price to selling price is up pretty close to 100. And it's been that way for quite a while. It's been 98, excuse me, 99 to 100 for at least the last six months we've been putting out the stats. So to the buyer who says, you know, I bought a lot of homes, I'm gonna offer, uh, you know, 80% of the list price. What do you think? So that's when you have to say, okay, let's talk about the current market conditions. Let's look at the trend is that prices are, places are selling at or above their list price. And that's the reality of the market. So if you're thinking that you wanna go in and make a lower offer, um, it's your choice. I'll present any contract you want, but you know why would you want to spend all that time and involve all that emotional energy in making an offer that's not even going to be in the running there? So that's important that the buyer understand the market, that the buyer understands you know what they're competing against, and what can make their offer look more attractive to a seller than another, even if it isn't the price. So always, always, always call the listing agent. Under, you know, there, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't want to call them. Read the remarks in the MLS so that you don't call and ask dumb questions. I mean, questions that shouldn't be asked. And then make sure you call the listing agent and say, hi, this is uh, Jeff Jones. I'm, I'm with Keller Williams. I've got a customer who's very interested in your house, love your house, and we want to put in an offer. And I just have a few questions for you. Number one, have you already had uh, other offers? Uh, and, and, and can you share a little bit about those offers? Are they you know, at or near list price or above list price? Okay, so you have two of them that are above and two others that are, that are list price. Okay, that's great. You know, would you be willing to share the, um, the terms of financing? Okay, well, you have two cash and you have two um, finance. Okay, great. Is there anything that your seller would like that would make our offer more palatable and more attractive to them other than just the price and the and the, uh, the the terms. Okay, so your seller would really appreciate being able to stay in the home for 30 days. All this is pretty frenetic. Closings are quick. They'd like to have time to plan, make sure you're offered, your loan gets approved or everything's good. Then they'd like to be able to plan their, their, their leap. And maybe that could be looking for somewhere else. Maybe that could be a storage unit. Maybe that could just be wanting to take their time and move out in an orderly way. So that's something that you can put into your offer that maybe the other offers didn't have. So maybe your offer, a lot of these offers are not significantly different in price. They're two, three, four, five thousand, generally not fifty thousand. So if your offer is in the running price wise and terms wise and closing date wise, a little bit of extra. Uh, consideration to the seller could get your offer to so we just talked about the what terms and conditions do you want to put in there and while I'm uh, here I'm not sure whether we got this in this slide presentation please 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 don't let your buyer say I'm going to waive inspections I want this guy to think oh you know I'll take this house whatever no problem um, we actually have a buyer notice that we want. I think we've gone over that in the last couple of weeks. And then if the buyer is emphatic about not inspecting, but they understand two things. Number one, they're going to hold us harmless for anything that happens in that house after they move in when they didn't take the time to evaluate it. And number two, they cannot access the house. Well, we've just shown it. We're writing an offer, zero days due diligence. And the next time they can legally access, access that home is the walkthrough inspection the day of or day before closing. And that normally, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? I, I, I still wanna be able to go in there and look at it and measure it for drapes and, and you know, do all the things that, you know, preparation for my move. Sorry, seller can say, 
Nope. See it, then walk through. Most people don't think through. They're so emphatic about trying to make their offer better that they don't think through the ramifications. So if you have a buyer that's dead set on waiving their inspections, we're going to ask your buyer to sign a waiver, which we call a buyer notice that says, hey, I'm making this decision. I'm not, I'm holding everybody from Keller Williams, their agents, the brokerage harmless for anything that might happen. And I can tell you that some of the worst phone calls I get are from a buyer who was a contractor who didn't need to inspect. And now all of a sudden he's got a leaking air conditioning and mold. And he wants to know who's going to pay for it. And I can only say to him, sir, you know, I, I'm sorry, but if you had inspected that, you know, you would at least, oh, it wouldn't have done any good. The leak, they, they couldn't find the leak till afterwards. Okay, well, so then, you know, the call to the seller. Okay, just send me 6,000. This is going to cost me 10,000. Send me 6,000. The seller says, hello, you waived inspections. And then they say to the, the agent, well, what are you going to do about your commission? You know, aren't you going to cut your commission? I mean, really, you, you should help me pay for this. Sorry, sir, it's already closed. You own the home. Nothing much we can do for you. It's a really sad situation. And even if your buyer wants to make their offer stronger, they can say, buyer shall not or will not ask for any repairs or credits, period. Well, it's a normal contractor and as is. That's telling the seller, I want to inspect this. I at least want to make sure that there aren't any skeletons here that I need to know about that could cost me thousands of dollars. And I don't, I'm not going to find out about it till after I move in. So always, always, always have your buyer do an inspection. It's a few hundred dollars. You can get them done quickly. At least let the buyer know if there's been any issues. And the second part of that notice is the buyer that says, okay, I've already lost two deals because I'm doing financing. I'm going in cash. I don't care. They, they can, you know, they can, they can do what they want. You say, well, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, I understand your frustration. I understand you want to make sure you get your offer accepted, but do you have the money to close in cash if for some reason your, your bank doesn't, isn't ready? And believe me, there are a number of large banks that start working on your package on the day of closing. So there's oftentimes delays, not have anything to do with the buyer that could create a delay in closing or the financing uh, situation. And if you're in the main, if you're in the regular financing contingency contract, you do have some options to extend that date purely because of a lender delay. You have none of those if you go in cash. So you really have to say to the buyer that wants to do that, are you willing to risk your entire deposit if this, for some reason you can't close? So make sure we don't put things into offers that um, would severely disadvantage the, the buyer. And you know what is your buyer's relationship going to be with you if they find things after they move in or if, they, or if their deposit is at risk? Okay, thanks, Doreen. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay, so close the chat up here. So let's talk about multiple offers. We want to communicate clearly with all parties. The seller approves the details that can be shared with potential buyer's agents that call. So make sure you and your seller, hopefully you did that at the listing contract time, but at least make sure you and your seller are on the same page of what information you're going to share back with uh, your, the buyer's agents as they call. And again, I always recommend as, as a best practice that you call the other side and scope the situation out before you send your offer in. So highest and best, okay? A lot of people um, use highest and best. They say highest and best by five o'clock on Thursday night. And it, maybe there have been offers that have been sent in and, you, and the listing agent calls you back and says, hey, we're taking highest and best at five o'clock Thursday. So there's some good parts to that. There's also some bad parts to that. And you can get yourself in a situation where you might lose an offer because somebody's like, well, I put in my best shot. And now you've come back and said, 
give me your highest and best. Forget about it. Um, I'm not interested in getting in a big bidding war here. So you might lose a good offer by doing highest and best. Again, your seller has a steering wheel at all times. Remember that your seller is in control of this whole process. They can accept the lowest offer. They can accept the offer that you think is the worst. That's their choice. It's their home. They're selling it. You're their advocate. Okay. So make sure you understand that all these decisions are, are the seller. And if the seller wants to go highest and best, okay. But just maybe you want to counsel your seller that one or two off, good offers could go away. This is what I said. The seller's in control. They can accept any offer they're choosing. They can accept no offer. So I've had a few calls uh, over the time saying, well, the seller just turned down full price cash offer. Um, can we get our commission? And I'm like, I don't think so. I think the seller has control. The seller can choose what they want. It's their home, just as if it was your home. You put yourself in their shoes and they decide that they, they don't like any of the offers and they can continue to, to accept more showings and more offers. They do not have to. Everybody okay? All right, let's talk about escalation clauses. Um, the first thing we wanna do is include a summary cover letter. Okay, there's another uh, um, really professional thing that you can do. Uh, there's several examples of that, one in the James Shaw Library. I've got a couple of them if you wanna see them. But basically it's a, it's a short cover letter that says, you know, hello, Mr. Seller, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I'm submitting an offer. My name is Mark Benson. I'm submitting an offer and my and I just want to give you on one page the summary of all the key terms and why we're making the offer and, and some of the things that we've done to give consideration to the seller. Okay. Um, that can be done in a, a, a simple uh, sheet of paper, maybe with your branding on there and the Keller Williams logo. And um, a nice thing. Why is that nice? Because if I'm receiving it, everything's there. I'm not flipping through a, a 12 page contract and two addendums and, and all that. So just a thought that this is always something that I think is a good thing for you to do. Is there a question? Okay. Anyhow, include a personal letter. Personal letters have, um, I think they were outlawed in one state and now they've challenged that in court and now they're acceptable again. But you have to be careful when somebody writes, somebody says, look, I want, a, I want my uh, uh, situation, my family, um, I, want, I want that to stand out. I want to know, I want the, I've had one where the, I want the seller to know I went to the same college that they did and I was in the same fraternity or something, you know, something like that. So they're okay as long as they don't um, violate any of the fair housing guidelines. So, you know, if you're saying I got a wonderful family and um, I had one where they said we have a child that's special needs child and can be, that's crossing the line. And you have to really look at these letters and make sure you're not um, incriminating the buyer with uh, some type of a familial situation um, a, um, a handicap, uh, something like that, where you're using that as a lever to get your offer to make to look a little better, not not a good idea. It it could be uh, a challenge, and it could be offending uh, the the seller, so that your offer isn't quite as important. But you know, you can certainly write an offer and say, "We have a wonderful family. We love the schools in the area. We love the fact they're close to the beach. Our family loves the beach." things like that that are not controversial. Um, and you might check with your broker, Jeff will say, read the letter, make sure it doesn't have anything controversial in it. And if the buyer wants to submit that with their offer, it, it's okay, but make sure you check the letter out and make sure there's nothing, you know, that that's, that's um, offensive or violating any of the, um, the fair housing guidelines. Consider backup offers on pending properties. Many are becoming primary due to market conditions. This is just as true today, maybe more so than when we wrote this slide a few months ago. 
Backup offers are great. They're especially good for a buyer who says, I really like that house. And you think there's a chance I can get it. And you say, yep, there could be. The other offer, you know, is, is just started and, and, you know, may be able to find out if it's an as is or not. But anyhow, it's a good idea. It doesn't limit your buyer from going out and looking at other properties. You don't have to put a date in there that you're, there's a date in the backup offer addendum that says, you know, it's good to such and such a date. You leave that blank, your offer is good until you rescind it. Okay, so do we want to include an escalation clause addendum? The answer is, here they are, right? What is an escalation clause? An escalation clause is a document that says, I'm going to bid $500,000 on a $500,000 house, or I'm going to bid $502,000 on a $500,000 house. And I'm also going to include an agreement that says, if another offer comes in over my $502,000, I'm willing to increase my price by a thousand or two thousand dollars until I hit a maximum of five fifty. All right. So is that a good scenario for an escalation clause? It could be. You're basically saying I'm willing to pay up to five hundred and fifty thousand. I'm willing to increment over the top of another offer by one or two thousand dollars up to my maximum. So what are the um, what are the advantages of that? The advantages are you may be able to buy that home for $512,000 because the next best offer was five hundred and ten, dollars and you're, and you're escalating by $2,000. Always use a small escalating factor because that is the amount you are paying more than the best offer. So don't, somebody says, yeah, I'm going to put $10,000 in there so my escalation looks strong. No, please, no, please, please don't do that. Um, you basically want a nominal amount, 1,000, 2,000, 2,500, over the top of the next best offer so that you don't have to pay 550. You can pay 512 or 515. So that's the advantage of the escalation clause is that you do not have to pay your, the maximum that you're willing to pay and you're willing to add your, um, your, your increased amount on top of the best offer that's received. So there's a lot of attorneys that hate escalation clauses. There are a lot of brokerages that do not allow them. We feel like that they have their place when properly used. Um, and what is the place? If your buyer says, um, I'd like to bid 502 and I'm willing to pay as much as 508, that's not really a great, great use of an escalation clause. Probably the buyer might want to consider just going in at 508. But if they're, if they're willing to pay a substantial amount more, but don't want to pay it unless they have to, um, then the escalation clause can make sense. Um, the cons are you're telling the seller when you submit your offer, how much, what's the maximum you're willing to pay. So if they're looking for highest and best and things like that, you're playing your cards um, up ahead of the actual final decision by the seller. So pros and cons, um, always, talk to your buyer and make sure they understand um, our particular escalation clause is based on a net price. Um, we encourage that because if there's concessions that are being asked for by the competing offer, that's less money to the seller. So if the offers are the same and one of them says seller to contribute $5,000 toward buyer's closing costs, that means that that offer is actually a net of $5,000 lower because that's what the seller's gonna net. So make sure you understand that the net price is what is the net proceeds from the seller. And that's what our escalation clause uses. Other escalation clauses do not mention net price. So know what you're up against. So we're gonna increase the, the offer price in increments toward our cap. And the, again, the increments, I recommend you keep them small because all you're doing is in incrementing over the top of another offer. Now, can the seller not accept your escalation clause? True, maybe the seller checks with their attorney. The attorney says, I hate those. Don't use them, don't accept them. They're not good, blah, blah, blah. The seller can say, sorry, I'm not gonna accept your escalation. 
and the seller theoretically could counter at your cap. I don't haven't heard of that much, but it, it has happened. So the seller, here's where people get somewhat upset. In order for the escalation clause to work, you have to provide as the listing agent, the bona fide contract that led to the escalation. Otherwise, how do you know? How would the buyer who had, had an escalation clause know that they could buy the place for 512 or 515? They need to see the offer that created the escalation. And it needs to be a legit offer. It can't be you call up your brother-in-law and say, hey, put an offer in for 512 because I think I can get more out of this escalation clause. It has to be a legit contract. It has to have, be signed by all parties. It has to, or by the buyers. Can you redact the buyer's name? Probably. Can you redact too much? No, because then it's not a, a bona fide contract. So make sure that the whole underlying uh, uh, foundation of an escalation clause is the bona fide offer that generated the escalation. And people feel like that's not fair because you're revealing what another buyer offered. Again, uh, as escalation clauses are not for everybody and they can be helpful, but they can also be controversial. Uh, we'll talk uh, briefly about appraisals, although um, lately uh, I've not seen as much trouble with appraisals um, that, that were generated back when this presentation was done when a lot of appraisals were coming in low. So make sure you do a CMA for the neighborhood, make sure you look at the recent comps. And in many cases, those recent comps will support a little bit high, the little bit higher pricing that the sellers offer. So always take a look at what the comps are. Um, you need to set seller again. We're back to setting seller and buyer expectations. You know, there's still a possibility that a, 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 a the appraiser will come back with appraisal of an amount less than the contract price. And if that's the case, and there's financing involved now, it's a cascading effect for the buyer. So now I've got the bid at 512. The appraisal comes in at 492. All right. So now there's a um, $20,000 difference between what the appraisal comes in at and what the contract price is. So if the buyer is borrowing money, they're doing an 80% loan, they're going to get 80% of the 492 not of the 512. So they're going to have to come up with additional cash in order to make the, the deal work. And there's um, a lot of different appraisal, what we call appraisal gap language out there. I have some that I'm happy to share with you. I've shared with many of you that basically say that if the property does not appraise for the contract price, the buyer will pay the difference in cash up to X thousand dollars. So you might say in your contract that, you know, your, your intuition is that this may not appraise for the full amount of the contract. So the buyer says, okay, I'm willing to kick in 10,000, 15,000. So you put that in the other terms and conditions, always get the legal language from me. Don't make it up. Please don't practice law without a license by creative writing in the other terms and conditions, but we do have language for most situations, and I'll send you that language, and it basically just says, if the property does not appraise, the buyer is willing to pay the difference between the contract price and the appraised value um, in, in, in cash up to a certain amount. So when appraisals weren't coming in regularly as um, they have been, I think recently, and it's, it's certainly not always a kind of a phrase, but more of these contracts, excuse me, are appraising than they had before. But you can always put an appraisal contingency into your contract, especially if you're paying cash, you can put an appraisal con contingency in which says that if the property does not appraise for X, I have the ability to walk away. So many people, when appraisals were coming back low, we're doing an appraisal contingency early so that, you know, remember the financing contingency, the appraisal is pretty much the last step. So you're waiting a longer period of time to find out what the situation is. 
So discuss the what if situation with your buyer. Discuss the what if situation with your seller. Because those are that's information that the um, yeah for sure. Um, that's also the information that the buyer and seller will need when the appraisal doesn't match the contract price. Okay, so a maximum appraisal gap would be for the sell the buyer to say, "I'm willing to pay the difference between the appraised value, which is what my loan's going to be based off of, and the." contract price in cash. No limit. I'm just willing to do it. That's maximum appraisal gap. Whatever the gap is, I'll pay it in cash. Um, the seller needs to understand that, and so does the buyer. Buyer needs to know that, hey, there could be a risk here. If you're using financing, there could be a risk that you might have to come up with some additional cash. Buyer understands that. They're not shocked by it. When the appraisal comes in low, they've already you've already had that discussion with them. So you've set their expectations to say, there's a possibility based on the comps that I see here, there's a possibility that this appraisal will not come in exactly to what we're paying. And, the, and if the buyer says, yeah, okay, I, I'll pay the difference, uh, or I'll pay $10,000, or I'll pay the maximum, um, that's an expectation. The buyer is expecting that that's a possibility. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, what I'm hearing anecdotally is buyers who say, you know, let's say it's a half million dollar property and I'll pay an appraisal gap up to 50,000, but I won't pay any more than 50,000. And so if the appraisal get, uh, comes in, they got a contract for 550 and the appraisal comes in at 490, then they don't, they're not forced to move forward and make $60,000 difference. They're only required to make a 50 or the, or the seller can say, no, I'm not going to accept that. You know, we're not going to change the terms of the contract and the parties have to part. So that leads me to the other side of the, the what if is that you're the listing agent and your seller has chosen a, a very aggressive price for that neighborhood. And you're okay with it because prices are going up and it's not grossly above uh, the comps, but it's above the comps. So I think you have to have the situation, you know, just as you say to the seller, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, if we're on the market for two weeks and we don't have any showings or any offers, then we need to think about reducing our price. The same discussion might happen with the seller, although they're not as inclined to have that discussion, is that to say, okay, if there's a, a, a difference between the appraised value and what our contract price is, are you willing to have any flexibility with the buyer on that? If they say, uh, absolutely not, or they may say, well, let's cross that bridge when we come to it and understand that if you get a good appraisal and it's still substantially below the contract price, the buyer's gonna walk because they're gonna be out on their financing contingency and you're gonna have to start over and you may find the same thing again or you may not find a cash buyer willing to pay as much as you are on the market for. So is it worth the seller saying, okay, look, we got a $20,000 difference here. I'll meet you halfway. I'll, I'll cut my price 10, you put the 10 in, beautiful, it's done. The seller doesn't have to go back on the market. The seller doesn't have to go through the whole process again. And, or, the seller might have a backup offer, but the backup offer is not for the amount that the, the current contract is. So the seller and buyer need to know what happens if it doesn't appraise. If it's not a problem, not discussed again. If it becomes a problem, remember Mr. and Mrs. Seller or remember Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, we discussed this, we took a look at the comps, we took a look at what the market's doing, and we said this could be a possibility. So again, You've set the expectations, and now there's not a lot of angst. So now we've taken this the frowning face off the jungle and give it in a smiling face. So again, we're going back. Multiple offers are stressful for both sides. Be calm, be respectful. Understand if there's a if there if there's a raised voice, 
or a um, you know expletive deleted that this is because of the emotion of the situation. You're the rock, you're the calm one, you're straight and level, be there. Set the expectations. We've talked almost in every slide about advanced conversations with the buyers and sellers about what might happen if, so that there are no surprises. And what does that mean? They're looking at you like, hey, you're in control. You know what you're doing. You've done this before. You can handle this and I can trust you. Communicate clearly with all parties. If you're the buyer's agent, always call the listing agent. Always ask a few questions about where, what the situation is with other offers, what the situation is with, with um, whatever they're willing to share with you, really. You don't have to be pushy, but you can say, hey, is it possible for you to share with me um, whether any of the other offers have financing or cash? And they may say, no, I, I'm sorry, I, my seller doesn't want to share that. That's fine. But most of the time, they might tell you. And if they tell you, you know a lot more about what you're going to put in your contract, which you may have written already, but before you show it to the buyers, you, you're, you're trying to, to, to validate the truth there. Including a, include a summary cover letter. I like summary cover letters. If they don't take long to prepare. You might get a little bit of branding out of it. Um, Buyer letters, um, yeah, buyers, certain buyers like to write them. They're like, <clears throat> I'm gonna write a letter that's gonna knock the seller's socks off. I wanna write it, can I write a letter? Sure, but I think you have to look at it and make sure you're not diving in to a, um, a one inch deep pool. You know, if it's gonna create angst, if it's gonna be a fair housing problem, then you gotta say to the buyer, sorry, you know, professionally we can't say those kinds of things if you want to soften that up or if you want to change your line of reasoning there fine but as it is we can't submit it make sure you look at it use an escalation clause yeah i mean if you want to use one or you're thinking about it you haven't even put your offer together but you you think maybe this might be you kind of get the feeling that there's going to be multiple offers here call broker jeff all i want to know is what's your objective and that you know how to use it and fill it out and explain it to your buyer properly. That's all I wanna know, but just putting it in the contract library is probably not gonna solve the problem. I want you to, to, to gain knowledge of how to use these clauses and to gain knowledge of how to get your buyer to understand all of the pros and cons. So call me, I'm happy to, I, they've been very useful to people and they've been very helpful uh, and, and so if you decide you want to use one, your buyers seem interested, call me up. So be aware of neighborhood conditions and appraisals. Don't be shocked by a low appraisal. When you have looked at the comps, you've looked at what else is for sale in the market, you look at the condition of those properties relative to the condition of the one that you're selling or that your buyer's buying, and you try to be aware of those things so that you can set the expectations. And if the expectations are your buyer really wants to buy the property and doesn't mind paying a little more, but they want to use financing. So you have to say, look, based on this, the, the, the comps, based on the conditions of the other uh, homes that are for sale or have just recently sold in this neighborhood, this is the way it is. You may find that you will get a full appraisal for this. Set the expectations, know what's going on in the neighborhood, know how many other things are are for sale or have sold. It's not a crime to call it a, a listing agent with a pending property and say, hey, you know, Mark, this is Jeff Jones. I, I, I've seen you a lot at Maybor. How's it, how's it going? Hey, look, I see you have a pending over on 123 Main Street and it says, um, you know, pending contingent. Um, can, you, can you just tell me a little bit about where that is relative to your list price? Sure. Sure, Jeff, I'll, I'll, I can tell you that this one went very close to the list. Thanks very much, Mark. Have a great day. Appreciate your time. Quick phone call to the pendings. Some people may not be friendly as others, but if you think about it and the situation was reversed and you had the pending and someone else was trying or you were trying to get a offer through and make sure it was priced properly, wouldn't you want that information? Wouldn't you want to share so it's 
Sharing is a two-way street, so is doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is the principle of the code of ethics, right? So that's important. That's it. That's the Q&A page, so we're done. Um, I think I can probably bring up quickly that letter and that spreadsheet. Um, right back here. The other thing I've noticed is, uh, in the last month is more buyer's remorse and more seller's remorse. As um, prices go up, yeah, and you, you're always, I mean, <laughs> I, was, I sat in on an interesting presentation the other day where um, the, the thesis was there's always going to be buyer's remorse. And so be prepared for it, be mentally prepared for that call that you get <laughs> and try to have empathy and try to have um, be prepared for that call, whether, you know, seller's remorse with today's market, not maybe not quite so much, but buyer's remorse, big time, you know, it's just really something that um, we see a lot of, and especially if there's, let's say there's been an escalation or, um, oh, I'm trying to, oh, I just want to download that. Anyhow, um, sorry, yeah. okay, cool. So that's that's important to understand, Mark. I mean, how do you talk to me a little bit about how you handle a phone call with buyer's remorse? Well, it, it's partly uh, the market. It's partly, the, as you said before, the neighborhood or the development and what's happening hyper locally within the community. Um, and then on the seller side, I had a recent conversation with another agent and the seller accepted an offer and the seller then regretted it and felt like they, if they had, they wanted to put it back on the market, if they could get out, they would, and they put it back on the market and make more money. So that's, and we don't normally, in a, in a normal market, we don't see that kind of uh, response. Sellers are generally pretty happy with, with what they get, unless it's a downward market. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen here. Boink, boink. So these are things that we talked about during our presentation. And the first thing I'll, I'll share with you is the buyer letter. Can everybody see that okay? Yes? All right. This we can send to you in word format. But basically this came out of, I think this is pretty much a James Shaw library kind of thing that we've adapted a little bit. But basically what you're doing is you're saying that you know you and your customers are anxiously waiting an update. So as soon as the sellers made the decision, these, these uh, emails need to go out. And basically they are just updating the buyer's agent I send my sincere sympathies as I understand firsthand what disappointment this is, is for you and your customers. It was very apparent at the time and effort, you, you know, every, that every agent made in preparing, you know, you're just saying, hey, we appreciate you. Here's some feedback that you can give to the buyers about the offers that came in in general. Um, and we're attaching the last page of your sales contract, <coughs> excuse me, as proof positive that the seller reviewed your offer in detail prior to making their decision, okay? Uh, thank you so much for your time, efforts, and amazing professionalism. I appreciate and admire you and hope we can work together in the future. So you can work, if that's not your words, change it to be more your words. As I say, I sent these out, and got a lot of nice feedback from them. So just your, your, your thought, if you like them, I'll be glad to share them with you. Um, the other one is the spreadsheet. So let's see if we can share that. There we go. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. All right. So this this is a an, a um, sample, obviously based on a contract 
negotiation, but you can see what we've done for the seller here. We've put the offer side by side. We've told them what type of contract it is. And even though uh, you can say that we will only accept standard contracts or only accept as is contracts, as you know, you gotta really accept and present any offer that's sent to you. You can counter it on a regular um, uh, contract. Um, so that's yours to use, yours to modify. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It had pretty much everything in there that we we kicked this around with other people and other and other uh, uh, realtors. Several people have, have used it and and made uh, you know improvements to it. So there it is. But this is a way of showing your seller very simply what the other offers are. Um, we had a couple withdrawn in the process that came in and said, "No, we're we're withdrawn." So there there your seller has on one piece of paper all of the different offers, not only the money, but the, um, if there was an escalation clause, earnest money, um, what type of, of, of financing, what type of loan it is. Um, so there you go. And again, if you're interested in any of this stuff, happy to share it with you. Mark, you put in the chat to talk a little bit about single agency versus transaction brokerage. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm kind yeah, well, of, especially when we're dealing with multiple offers. Right. I'm kind of a transaction broker kind of guy for this market. I know you are, do a great job as a single agent. So talk to me about what you see the differences in single agency uh, with, with, this, with this multiple offer situation. Well, in the hot market and low inventory situation, I think there's probably a, a slightly greater chance that we're going to have someone within our market center uh, bring, the, bring an offer. Whereas in a, in a traditional market where the average days on market was 90 to 180 days um, with 7,000 or more members of the Naples board and uh, how many thousands on Marco Island, the odds were that the offer was gonna come from somebody else who wasn't within our brokerage. But in today's market, we've got more agents in our market centers. And so there's that opportunity for, for them to bring a buyer, in which case you and I've had the conversation is, have you prepared the seller uh, that you're not going to be a fiduciary of theirs? Yeah, and uh, when, they, when they're coming to expect that uh, from the first point of view. So if you've if you started out as a transaction brokerage, you probably have, no, you have nothing to, to really uh switch um if if you are holding an open house and someone comes to your open house and wants to write an offer um i guess you have two choices you can still operate a single agency and new and have no uh, brokerage relationship with the buyer or you have to transition to transaction brokerage in which case does the seller understand why you're sort of behaving slightly differently because now you're not giving them negotiating tips on what kind of counter offer to make, et cetera. Yeah, it, it's almost as though single agency, which is more of a fiduciary relationship, it's a closer relationship, is, is helpful to a seller in the, in the, in the uh, multiple offer situation. But you're right, if the minute you get a, another um, wrinkle in the in, in terms of who's submitting the offer or, or in terms of having someone approach you to write your own, write an offer for them, it becomes a little more complicated. So there you go, good, good, all good points. Um, it's 2.56, hey, pretty good. Got there right almost to the end. Um, if there aren't any more questions or anything, um, again, let me know if, if any of this information you want, the slides, the letters, the spreadsheets, just send me an email. I'll be glad to return it to you by return email. Mark, thank you for joining us and offering your insights. It's always a pleasure to have you. And for everybody else, thank you. Thanks for your attention. Have a great day and very question. Thanks, Broker Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. I have to stop the recording.